My name is Natalie Samelnik, and I'm the president of the Congress of Russian Americans. It is my sincere pleasure and a great honor to present the Certificate of Merit posthumously to Igor Ivanovich Sikorsky to commemorate his induction into the CRA Hall of Fame of outstanding Russian Americans and honoring his invaluable contributions in the field of aviation. I would like to thank the Congress of Russian Americans for voting unanimously for this award. I would like to also thank the Museum of Russian Culture of San Francisco for allowing us to present it during their lecture on aviation. And of course, I'd like to thank our long-standing member of CRA, Igor Sikorsky, Jr. Thank you and congratulations. Welcome to a meeting in the Alex, museum maybe. that was Alex. founded in 1948. So we've been around for a while. And due to the wonderful volunteer group we have and the work of Margarita, we are blessed to be still in operation and continuing to find very interesting uh, additions to the museum. For example, there's a man here, Ivan Utyachin, who lives in Marin County, and he has just given us 14 old photographs of the Emperor Nicholas II and his family at a review, of both in St. Petersburg and in an outlying area that probably was a, a military installation out in the environs of uh, St. Petersburg, and we've had a number of wonderful gifts have come in, particularly in the last three or four years. So uh, we are blessed that we're still being able to find people that have materials. Uh, this was a particularly interesting one, and Ivan told me that that his father always was worried that this somehow, somehow would fall into the wrong hands whatever that means, uh, but it's got in the right hands. We can really take good care of that, those 14 amazing photographs. And I wanted to tell you a little bit about my background. It's very much in the news right now. My aunt was born in Mariupol, and my father was born in Berdyansk. Those are two ma major cities that are now uh, under attack in the in, in, in in uh, um, Ukraine, so I, I'm very, I very feel for all the people there, and I think that we all, all over the world, including in Russia, feel the sadness of what what has happened, and uh, I don't know uh, how this will turn out, but there was some news that uh, yesterday that. The Russians were trying. We were not. We we're not going to try to attack uh, Kiev anymore and withdraw and set up defensive lines of their troops. And it's an amazingly big, big country, and it has a. It's, Russia was founded in in what is now Ukraine, and uh, and so I remember my uh, cousin in, when I was visiting Russia telling me that in 1954, when Crimea was attached to Ukraine, uh, how sad he was. He was depressed for three, three weeks. And uh, then President Khrushchev decided to add Crimea to Ukraine. And uh, so the Russians went for that very, in, the 19, in, 19, in 2014. They went to get it back again, which they did. And there was a very, there was a pundit in New York, or in, actually in Virginia, who said that the Russians should have taken the Donetsk and Lugansk areas right away and just made a path between Lugansk and, and uh, Mariupol uh, uh, so that that area would be directly uh, available for Russians to move their troops back and forth. So that didn't happen. 
and we had the events of 2014. And I remember Mrs. Newland, who is now our Deputy Secretary of State, she was standing in, 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 Kiev, in Kiev and she said, we spent five billion dollars to get to this point. And this was in 19, this was in 2014. So we, we have been arming uh, the Ukrainian government since early 2000s, since the early 2000s. So we have a play a part in this tragedy as well, as well as Russia and people who are in the country itself. So my feeling is that we can get to some kind of resolution as quickly as possible before this accelerates to more involvement. So that, I'm hopeful and I hope that that will happen. So thank you very much for being here. We have a wonderful presentations today, so we're glad you're here, and we're glad we are here. I covered aviation in Russia and developments in Europe at the same time, and I covered the period from about uh, 1890 to the beginning of the, of the First World War just as an overview. Uh, today, however, uh, we'll be speaking uh, strictly about the Russian pilots and Russian contributions in World War I. That will be the, the subject of, of today. Our presentation altogether is called Canvas Wings and Iron Personalities, and today's episode is going to be entitled Cossacks from the Clouds. So let me just start out talking about aviation uh, in general and the, the aircraft uh, involved. Can you hear me if I don't use the microphone? Thank you. <laughs> All right. <clears throat> so the early aircraft were basically made as light as possible. They were made of wooden frames covered with canvas. This canvas was then sewn on by seamstresses, which put seamstresses in great demand, and actually they became very critical in the aircraft manufacturing business, particularly in France, who was the largest manufacturer of aircraft uh, during the First World War. So these wooden frame machines were covered in fabric, that was sewn on, and then they applied a sealant to this, this canvas. This sealant was a very toxic, uh, very flammable uh, sealant, and it was called dope. And it acquired that name for the condition that it created in the poor workers who had to paint this stuff on. They were basically getting stoned from the fumes of this uh, dope. Uh, but this was necessary in order to shrink the fabric so it would fit tightly uh, onto the wings. The engines at the time the highest horsepower engines at the time were 80 horsepower. Uh, if any of you have motorcycles, you know that you have more motorcycle. You have more horsepower in your motorcycle than these engines did. Uh, they were also quite unreliable. That was a big problem uh, in those days. Uh, metallurgy was still being developed. Uh, they didn't understand uh, petrochemicals and gasoline mixtures as well. So this was all new technology, and as such, it was quite unreliable. So, you are basically flying a wooden aircraft covered with flammable fabric and your fuel tank is either located behind your instrument panel or conveniently underneath your canvas seat. So, needless to say, these aircraft burned extremely well. Often pilots would take a loaded pistol with them and rather than go down in flames with their aircraft, they would prefer a quick pistol shot to the head. Which brings me uh, to my next point, that there were no parachutes in these aircraft in World War I. Uh, parachutes had been invented, but they were basically too large to fit into the small aircraft at the time. Now, the Germans did develop a usable aircraft or usable parachute for their fighter aircraft towards the end of the war. Uh, there were reports of German pilots bailing out and 
the parachute's actually working. And uh, the British also developed working parachutes by the end of the war. However, they did not distribute them to their flyers because they felt that, and I quote, it would encourage their pilots to abandon their aircraft too soon. Uh, as a result, the British casualties were uh, extremely high. Uh, the British pilot training was also quite black in, in many respects. So, there you are in your wooden airplane that burns like a match head. You have no parachute. You're in a freezing cold cockpit with no heat. Uh, oh, and there's people trying to kill you at the same time. All right, so needless to say, it was a hazardous endeavor. The life expectancy of many World War I pilots was measured in weeks, usually two. Many pilots arrived and never survived their first mission. So they arrived at the airfield, unpacked their gear, and that was the last that was ever seen of them. So <clears throat> it was very, very hazardous. Besides combat, fully one-third of the accidents and casualties happened in accidents, usually landing accidents. Again, the aviation was very new, flying was new, and again, the training was very substandard. So you had all those challenges ahead of you. Now the World War I pilots are often portrayed as knights of the air, doing to the death against their skilled adversaries among the clouds. That was the publicity of the day. To a large extent, uh, that was true. Uh, pilots at that time could actually identify their individual foes, sometimes by the markings on their aircraft. And also this was done by the press to promote uh, some positive, something romantic about the war. For the war in the trenches was simply too brutal, uh, too horrible to express as millions upon millions upon millions of men were fed into the industrial meat grinder of World War I. So this publicity was a way to again, give the, the war a, 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 some, some kind of romance. Now, among the airmen in First World, First World War, there also was a code of chivalry that they observed in combat, which was pretty much extinct by that time. Uh, part of that code of chivalry meant allowing a crippled aircraft to perhaps stumble back to base and somehow make it back. Uh, if an enemy plane was shot down and the pilot survived, uh, it was not uh, kosher to go and shoot the pilot while he's on the ground. Uh, and there were reports of English pilots who were captured by their German uh, ca uh, victors and actually entertained at dinner at the German's airfield. The Russian pilots, when they would capture a, a German pilot, would often have the German pilot photographed with them get a copy of the photograph and then drop it over the Russian, uh, excuse me, the German airfield to verify the survival of their comrades, or if they did not survive. So <clears throat> this chivalry existed oh, for about the first part of the war, maybe until 1915. Uh, a lot of this was because the flyers of the early days tended to be of the upper class. And that was by necessity, because in order to get your military wings in the services at the time, you first had to have your civilian wings. So you basically paid for your own flying lessons. And flying lessons, just like today, are very expensive. So it tended to attract the more well-to-do gentlemen. And they brought some of that gentlemanly conduct uh, to the war. However, by 1916, most of these early flyers were dead, and the chivalry became kind of a thing of the past. But it did exist uh, in the early days. Now, um, I want to talk a little bit about the differences between the Eastern uh, and the Western Front. Uh, the Western Front consisted only of a stretch of about 400 miles from the English Channel to the uh, borders of Switzerland. And practically all of the aerial combat occurred over that 400 mile radius. Now, the Eastern Front, 
on the other hand, actually was comprised of three fronts covering hundreds and hundreds of miles. And so air combat was less frequent. Uh, and because of the distances involved, lots of times they never even intercepted any enemy aircraft. Also, <clears throat> covering that much ground with just a couple hundred aircraft uh, is, is virtually impossible. At the beginning of the war, France had about 350 aircraft. Uh, Russia had approximately 300. Uh, Britain and Germany were, were not far behind. So another aspect about the Russian front as opposed to the uh, Western front, while the Western front was very static and not moving, there was much movement during the offensives on the Eastern front. It was a fast moving front. Uh, as a result, the lines changed a lot. When the lines changed, the airfields had to be moved. These aircraft had a very short range, so they had to operate very, very close to the troops. So every time the lines changed, the airfield had to be moved. Now, this put a <laughs> tremendous strain, not only on the men, uh, but on the machines. Another problem with having those distances involved was that pilots would often get lost. At this point in time, your only navigational tool was your compass and your good sense. So many pilots got lost. Sometimes they even landed in the wrong place. There was an incident on the Western Front late in the war when an entire flight of American bombers mistakenly landed on a German airfield. The astonished Germans, uh, not knowing quite what to do, uh, took the aircraft and then wrote a note to the American Embassy in which they stated, while we appreciate the squadron of bombers, what shall we do with their commander? And who says the Germans have no sense of humor? <laughs> I know such people. <laughs> so do I. But some of them do have a good sense of humor, and I thought that was a pretty, a pretty good response. <clears throat> so again, this, this type of chivalry faded as the war went on, as the war became more and more uh, brutal. Now, the early aircraft were very, very light and very uh, fragile, as I said, and basically couldn't carry a lot of weight. It wasn't until a little bit into the war where they could actually have enough power to carry a machine gun. <clears throat> this is an example of the, of the early aircraft, again, very underpowered and unarmed. Now, <clears throat> as I was beginning to say, once they had enough power to put a machine gun on it, the obvious position would be to have it firing forward. However, there is the problem of the propeller here. Now, as you can see on this slide, if you look at the base of the propeller right there, this particular Frenchman named Roland de Garot, who was a very famous pre-war French pilot, mounted this steel deflector blade on his propeller. And while this was crude, it actually worked. Of course, you never knew where the deflected rounds were going to go, but that's the chance you took. Uh, but it did work. He ended up shooting down five German aircraft and caused the German high command to be thrown into a panic. They didn't know what to do. Uh, unfortunately for Garot, he had engine problems and he had to land behind German lines. So the Germans now understood how he was able to do it. They then decided to create a more efficient way of doing this and they created a gun synchronization gear. And basically <clears throat> what they would do is they would attach a cam to the propeller so that when the propeller passed in front of the machine gun, it would interrupt the firing of the gun. So the gun would stop firing when the propeller was directly in front of it. As soon as the propeller passed, it would resume firing. All right, this was the gun synchronization gear. Now, once the Germans had <clears throat> developed that and started equipping some of their squadrons, their Fokker Eindeckers, with this gun, it uh, obviously created a panic in the Allied high command, because they did not have a counter for this. Uh, fortunately um, for the Allies, a Eindecker pilot inadvertently crashed behind Allied lines. So now the Allies could take that apart, figure out how to make the system work on their aircraft. And so the World War I aircraft then became armed with machine guns. 
And at that point, the blood-stained trenches and the carnage of the trenches would now be staining the skies. For now, with the advent of the machine gun, the Grim Reaper now had wings. Now, I'd like to talk about several of the personalities involved uh, during the Russian and World War I. And one of the first ones we must talk about is Igor Sikorsky. Now, I did cover Sikorsky's career in a bit of detail in the first presentation. However, you really can't talk about Russian aviation in World War I without mentioning Sikorsky. Uh, he had designed a couple of fairly successful biplanes, but his main area of research and innovation was in multi-engined aircraft. And I have one here. This was built at the request of the Russian Museum, and this is Sikorsky's uh, Ilya Murovets. Uh, it was a groundbreaking aircraft in, in many respects. First of all, it had four tandem engines. It had an enclosed cockpit. Something did not become standardized until the 1930s. Uh, they were actually going to install heaters and use these as commercial airliners, and then the war broke out. There were only a couple of aircraft built at the time, so they were used uh, in reconnaissance. Now, just to give you a little bit of scale at this point, I have a, a man figure here, so you can see the. Get this here. You can kind of see how big this aircraft was. It was huge, and this is in comparison to the fighter aircraft of the day, which obviously much, much smaller. <laughs> so there were a couple of these built at the beginning of the war and they were immediately used for reconnaissance with their incredible range. And once they were mounted with some cameras, they could do long range reconnaissance behind German lines. Uh, this shows some of the interior shots and uh, them loading the plane up as bombers. <clears throat> Later on, versions were converted to be bombers and armed with up to eight machine guns. So they became a very, very formidable weapon. Also, because of their structural integrity, they were very, very hard to shoot down. There was one instance where Ilya Mirdomets returned to base with over 200 bullet holes in it. Uh, there was another instance <clears throat> where they were making a, a raid on a German rail yard the pilot was hit by artillery fire as well as enemy machine gun fire from German aircraft. He was severely wounded. The co-pilot basically shielded the pilot with his body and in turn got wounded himself uh, in order to keep control of the aircraft. On top of both pilots being wounded, the, one of the engines were all, also, excuse me, also hit. Now the Ilya Mutimits had a unique feature in that it had a side door here in which a flight engineer could actually crawl out of, get onto the wing, and work on the engine while in flight. All right? This particular flight engineer worked on the engine for a half an hour in flight long enough for the bomber to make it back to base. All of them were awarded the uh, St. George Medal, fourth class. Uh, the bomber because there were no effective bomb sites, the effects were literally hit or miss. So they were basically used for reconnaissance. There was one raid in particular, though, however, uh, against a rail junction, and they managed to luckily hit an ammunition train and blew up about 14,000 artillery shells. So that must have been quite a night of fireworks. So <clears throat> as the war progressed, however, uh, and as the Russian Revolution began, the Reds captured the factory where they made the Ilya Mirovets. So the spare parts for the uh, Ilya Mirovets were cut off, and so they gradually were faded out of use for lack of spare parts. By 1922, uh, none of those aircraft were, were flying. Uh, however, it did show the way of the future. First of all, the engines in line like this. Right, the enclosed cockpit, um, heaters, all kinds of advanced features. So it, it showed the way of the future. <clears throat> now, Sikorsky was just 25 years old when he designed this aircraft. Uh, because of the revolution, 
he of course had to leave and then had a very successful career in the United States. And again, I covered that part in the first presentation. But his contributions, specifically the Ilya Muromets, was, was very far-reaching and, <clears throat> again, showed the way to the future. So now I'd like to talk about some of the individual combat pilots. And the first one I'd like to talk about is Pyotr Nikolaevich Nestorov. His school records noted when he graduated, and I quote, Nestorov is sharp-witted, adamant in following the decisions he makes, expresses dynamic, proactive character, an ideal type of future officer with considerable moral qualities and courage. Now, Nestorov <coughs> became interested in aviation, and so he attended the aviation school at Gatchina. And there he became quite an innovator, uh, developing his own designs and also practicing different aerial techniques. And one of those techniques was the loop. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, this is Nestorov with his first daughter, I believe, and his wife. Uh, Nestorov ended up having uh, two children. Now, the loop at the time was thought to be uh, impossible. And the loop is basically just what it sounds like. You go up and around and come back down. All right? Now, it was thought to be impossible because at this point in the air, the wings basically are upside down and they're not working. And so it was thought that the plane would therefore fall out of control. <laughs> Nestorov correctly concluded that with enough speed and inertia, he could come over the top and make it back down which he did, and he did this at an air exposition in 1913 in which many senior officers were present. Now, Nestorov had just completed a maneuver that no one else in the world had ever done and was thought to be impossible. So when he landed, his superior officers came up to him and promptly arrested him. The charge was taking undue risk with a machine, the property of his government. Now, this was quickly became big news throughout the world, what Nestorov had accomplished. Once the significance of his achievement was realized by the Russian high command, they forgave him, and they promoted him. He then became the uh, commander of the 3rd Air Division uh, in, um, on the Eastern Front. Now, at the beginning of the war, as I mentioned, there were no weapons or machine guns available. So Nestorov decided he had to do something. He had taken an oath as a Russian military officer, aviation officer, never to allow an enemy aircraft to fly over Russian heads. So he tried to figure out a weapon. So what he did, he basically attached a long cable to his aircraft with a anchor on the end of it. All right? And the idea was that he would take his aircraft, put the cable dangling down, snag the enemy aircraft, release the cable, and then fly away. So that was the plan. Well, as Nestorov took off, the cable fell off. So there he was, flying his patrol with his weapon that had fallen off the aircraft. And about that time, he spotted a German Albatross B-3 observation aircraft. And yet, what was he going to do about it? He lost his cable. As I said, though, he had taken that oath. So Nestorov decided he had to do something. So he decided he was going to ram the enemy aircraft. Now, I want to point out that this was not a suicide attack. Nestorov was a skilled pilot, probably the most skilled pilot in Russia, if not the world at the time. So I believe what his plan was, was to come down, hit the enemy aircraft on the wings, damage it enough, and then fly away. However, in the impact, both of the aircraft got tangled up. Uh, these aircraft being wood and wire and fabric, it became just one tangled up mess. And so, unfortunately, both aircraft uh, fell to the ground. 
This, however, was the first aerial victory ever scored by anyone in the world. And Nestorov will always be remembered for that, uh, as well as developing the loop. He's also remembered in many ways in Russia. Many streets are named after him. And there's also a uh, medal that is given in his honor for certain uh, academic, excuse me, aerobatic, <laughs> uh, aerobatic achievements. Now, the next pilot I'd like to talk about is Alexander Kozakov, who, like Nestorov, graduated from the flight school of Kachina and became very interested in aviation. He graduated in September 1914, just a little after the war started. He decided to follow Nestorov's example, but added uh, an additional little, okay, so here you can see the, the cable that he had. There's the, the nasty anchor that he was going to drop on the aircraft. He also was going to attach an explosive charge to this. And I believe, I'm not sure, I believe that's the explosive charge right there, but we, we can't be certain. Uh, but this is his, his setup as it was. Also, this, I want to make a comment on the excellence of this colorization of this photograph. This is just amazing. Um, and it gives you a good idea of what uh, Kozakov was trying to do. So Kozakov attached his cable to the aircraft and took off looking for an, an enemy flyer. After he took off, I'm going to read his combat report to you. And I quote, the damned drag anchor got caught and was dangling underneath the enemy airplane so I decided to strike across the upper sides of the albatross with the undercarriage of my moraine. Basically, he was going to duplicate the same kind of uh, attack, basically, that uh, Nestorov had done. I, and I continue with his report. Without a moment's thought, I pressed the elevator down and collided with the enemy. The undercarriage, which is now called the landing gear, the undercarriage folded up and then something exploded with a loud whistling noise. Seconds later, a piece of my marine struck the elbow on one side. The albatross folded up its wings and dropped like a stone. One of my propeller blades was missing. Having lost my bearings, I began gliding. I could guess where the Russian line was. I was turned upside down, but near the earth I was able to correct my flight and land safely. The impact of the aircraft had been so strong that my undercarriage had been crushed towards the wings. But he did survive, and that became his first of many victories. Kozakov ended up scoring uh, 20 confirmed victories. And when I say the term confirmed, by that I mean in order for a victory to be officially credited to a pilot, someone other than the pilot had to see the enemy airplane crash. Right, either a squadron mate, another crew member, or even somebody on the ground. But it had to be witnessed in order for the victory to be officially credited. Now, as the machine guns slowly increased, uh, Kozakov acquired a new French fighter, the Newport 10. But they did not have the synchronization gear yet. So what Kozakov had done is he took a machine gun and basically pointed it up and over the propeller, so it flew over the propeller arm. However, at this kind of angle, you can just imagine the difficulties in aiming. Nevertheless, Kozakov was able to score two victories, having the gun mounted in that manner. Now, Kozakov spent three years in combat and was the commander of a, a fighter squadron. And once the Russian Revolution broke out, he was offered a command by the Bolsheviks to command the 7th Air Division of the Soldiers' Revolutionary Committee. Now, Kozakov declined the commission. He needed a bit of a rest after three years of combat flying, and he was not interested in flying for the Bolsheviks. After he took some time off, he came back and he joined the Royal Air Force, which was operating in Russia in support of the whites, along with some American troops as well. 
So Kozakov ended up becoming part of the Royal Air Force. You can kind of see the strain in his eyes and uh, the stresses he was under. Now, <clears throat> Kozakov in that position was now having to fight his fellow Russians. And this was something that just tore at his heart. How could he fight against his fellow countrymen? For three years, he had defended his homeland against invaders. And now he had to fight his own, his own people. So this really took a toll on Kozakov. Some of these Bolsheviks that were flying through the other side were his comrades in arms. Some of them he knew personally. How could he fight against these people? Then, in 1919, when the British, who were supporting the whites, realized that the Reds would probably end up winning, they withdrew their support of the Red Army. When they pulled out, that threw Kozakov into a bit of a depression. In August 1919, he took off, and as if to make a loop, at the top of the loop, he stalled his aircraft and went straight into the ground. Uh, most of his squadron mates believe it was intentional. And thus ended the career of Russia's greatest ace, and we can only imagine what might have been had things been differently. Uh, on his gravestone, it reads, Peace to your ashes, hero of Russia. Now, we have one more personality to talk about, and this is a very, very unique individual, uh, for it was a woman, an actual princess, a real-life princess, who was the very first female military pilot in the world, Princess Eugenia Shostakova. Now, the princess was, was young and beautiful, things that I am not. So I thought it would be a little bit more fitting if a young woman told the story of the princess. And so I have, as a guest lecturer here, Victoria Babikova, uh, to tell you the story about the princess. And then we shall conclude with some closing remarks. But I want you now to greet Victoria as the princess. If you would, please, princess. There were several female aviators, some French and some Russian. We shall focus on one in particular, an actual princess, Evgenia Mikhailovna Shakhovskaya. This adventurous young woman, at her own expense, received flying lessons, receiving her license in 1912. She was one of a kind. She used to repair her own car and enjoyed it. At the advent of war 1914, she joined the nursing volunteer corpus, yet she wrote the Tsar that she would be a valuable asset in the upcoming air war and requested to join the military air fleet. The Tsar, impressed with her boldness and patriotism, granted her request, and as such, the princess became the first female military pilot in the world. The princess was posted with the 1st Field Squadron in a reconnaissance unit. While the princess claimed she had been in combat, there exists disputed combat record for her. The princess was not only talented, but very beautiful. Rumors were speculating about her affairs with senior military officers, although evidence remains scanty. In 1916, the princess was accused of spying and passing information to Germans. As a personal opinion, I think it was a setup by a jealous general or jilted admiral. At any rate, she was convicted and sentenced to be shot. However, through the generous mercy of Tsar Nicholas II, she was instead sentenced to life imprisonment in a nunnery where she stayed until 1917. With the victory of the Reds, her life was in jeopardy. Since she was already imprisoned by the Whites, the Reds offered her a position in exchange for release. She 
would work for the Bolshevik secret police as an executioner. In the course of her duties, she became involved in narcotics. At this point, the story becomes confusing. Some state that while in a drug-induced rage, she shot and killed an associate and she died in a subsequent shootout. Another version states that she was captured and later shot. Lastly, another version states she died while staying with the family near Kiev in 1920. I will let you, the audience, decide. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, that concludes the presentation, our second part of the Canvas Wings and Iron Personalities. I want to thank several people. First of all, Margarita, who made all of this possible. Turn, turn that around. Um, she began all this. She gave me the idea for the presentation, and I, I can't thank her enough for getting me involved here. Uh, the other key person in this is the gentleman with the fine naval hat there, manning the IT and computer controls, uh, Georgi. Uh, he's been my he's been my co-pilot, navigator, translator, IT guy, and a bunch of other stuff as well. I also want to thank all the other people here at the Russian Museum who've been so helpful to me. Um, and giving me background information and just getting me more familiarized with Russian culture. So, uh, are there any questions or comments about anything this morning? In this room, we have a pilot. Oh! <laughs> he doesn't have a question, so Big how, deal. how many years? How many years? 42. Wow. Two years. Wow. Wow. <laughs>